The Girl Scouts, or Girl Guides, have been around for just over a hundred years. You probably think of them as smiley campers, selling cookies, and earning badges, but I'm gonna tell you a different story. Today, let's talk about their always bright, do good deeds motto, and what happened when the world went into chaos. Let's talk about the Girl Guides in the Second World War. Hi, I'm Tristan Johnson and you're watching Step Back History. Since 1910, the Girl Guides have given young girls a way to make the world a better place through community action, service to others, education, and advocacy. They began as a protest when in 1909, a group of girls arrived at a Boy Scout rally in the UK and declared themselves to be Girl Scouts. The founder of the Boy Scouts agreed, and a year later, the guides were formed. They began in the UK, but quickly spread to Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, New Zealand, and South Africa. By 1912, they had spread further, including the beginning of the Girl Scouts in the United States. Today, there are Girl Guides or Girl Scouts in over 100 countries. The future looked bright for the Girl Guides, though not all was well in the world. Two years after the founding of the Guides, the world plunged into chaos. An assassination crashed the House of Cards, keeping the European empires at peace. They enlisted millions of men, and with the aid of mechanization, unleashed the most brutal war machine ever known to humankind. Weapons capable of destruction at a scale never seen before, trench warfare, and fighting nearly across the globe to find what we call the First World War. The Girl Guides had a minor role in the conflict, but to a much smaller degree than they would have decades later. In the UK, the British security service MI5 used scouts as messengers. Don't worry, not on the battlefield. At least I hope not. However, in 1915, they replaced the Boy Scouts with Girl Guides. According to an internal document, MI5 preferred to enlist the help of young girls over young boys because they proved more amenable and their methods of getting into mischief were on the whole less distressing. This was the only record I can find of using the Girl Guides during the First World War. After four long bloody years, the war was over. The entire world was reorganized. International organizations were formed, all in the hopes that nothing on this scale would ever happen again. Well, I think we all know how that turned out. In 1939, after a series of land grabs, the British finally decided to declare war on Germany in response to their invasion of Poland. The Second World War would end up costing tens of millions of lives, displace many more, and completely upend the world order all over again. Like the conflict before, this would be a total war. It would not be one with fancy tactics on battlefields, but a much larger scale. Entire economies with the resources of numerous allies and colonial subjects threw everything they had into the meat grinder of war. Young men enlisted in huge numbers. Factories turned from making household objects to weapons in order to feed the insatiable maw of war. The British also engaged Japan as the Japanese Empire invaded China and a large number of other Pacific and East Asian countries. The Japanese conquered large swaths of Chinese territory including a lot of places where British and American people lived. This clash of empires seems like a very odd place for Girl Guides to be. However, when researcher Janie Hampton was working on a book about the history of the Girl Guides, she found a strange journal entry. We sang our song yesterday and it went. We might have been shipped to Timbuktu. We might have been shipped to Kalamazoo. It's not repatriation, nor is it yet starvation. It's simply concentration in Chifu. The guide sang this for a Christmas show in 1942 in a place called Wei Xian. Wei Xian is a concentration camp one of many built for captured American, British, and European civilians living in China. About 150 children were captured with teachers, but no parents. Don't let the cheeriness of the song fool you. Rumors about atrocities like the rape of Nanking were well known to the prisoners, and many prayed at night for nothing but a quick death. People died of starvation in these camps. Imprisoned monks would sneak in eggs and the Girl Guide leaders would crush up the shells to, into powder and make the girls eat it for calcium. So what do you do in such a hopeless situation? I guess you earn some badges. The leaders turn to activities like collecting scraps of coal to stay warm and eating disgusting food into games. They even enforced table manners, sang guide songs, and insisted on good hygiene, all while surrounded by guard dogs and men with rifles. According to records from the camp, the guides provided stability and morale to many of those imprisoned. And as you might remember in my video about the HMS Jersey, in these conditions, sometimes clinging to happiness and normality is the thing that lets you survive. In other places, the Girl Guides performed unimaginable acts of bravery and help with the war effort. Part of the Girl Guide vow is to serve your country, and many of the guides took this vow to heart. They risked life and limb for the war effort. The Girl Guides 
quickly found work to do in the Second World War. They picked up their jobs with MI5, running messages for them. The motto of Be Prepared was also taken to the extreme. In 1942, the Guide started the Guide Emergency Committee. They prepared for the aftermath of the war, working with groups like the Salvation Army, the Quakers, and the Red Cross. The Girl Guides joined a group called the Guides International Service, which involved intense physical training. They raised money, and 100 trained Girl Guide volunteers followed the British Army to set up field hospitals and canteens. Highlights of their contribution include caring for 1,700 starving people in Rotterdam and helping tackle an outbreak of typhoid in war-ravaged Germany. They were also among the first civilians to arrive at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, and they were tasked with de-lousing the inmates. Some ran a refugee camp in Greece. One Greek woman spotted a guy named Alison Duke's uniform and embraced her, shouting, The guides from England! You've come! You've come! Guides even performed acts of heroism in the darkest corner of the war, the ghettos and camps of the German Reich. Most brave of all were the guides who joined up with the Polish resistance under Nazi occupation. The Nazis banned the girl guides, turning them into an underground organization. These girls would rescue children from ghettos in Warsaw, Vilnius, and Piastok, and snuck food to prisoners in Auschwitz. They would go onto the roofs of houses and shovel off incendiary bombs, while other guides waited in the street with sand to put them out. Some guides worked in children's homes as nurses. They would turn old linens into bandages and give out food. One guide company organized over 15 auxiliary hospitals and refugee centers in places like schools, cinemas, and centers for lost children. They opened kitchens that fed up to 600 children a day, sometimes even crossing enemy lines to feed soldiers. Through all this heroism, the girls were always at risk of capture and execution. Two guides that helped a British soldier escape from a prison camp were captured at the border of Yugoslavia. Their names were Olga Prokopova and Maria Yasinska. One was beheaded, the other was hanged. Two other girls were captured by the Germans distributing illegal literature and died in Auschwitz. A group of Silesian guiders monitored the radio and produced an underground newspaper. Three of those girls were captured and they too died at Auschwitz. The guides today don't have a war effort to participate in, but they still do a lot of impressive stuff. In 2009, they raised a million British pounds for changing the world to help communities in places like Bangladesh, Chile, and South Africa. Girl guides have swum across the English Channel, sailed around the UK, and even made it to the base camp of Mount Everest. The organization to this day fosters what they call girl greatness, and they help millions of young girls build the confidence and skills to become the future leaders of this rock. I know it's not fair for me to gush so much for such an organization, but I really feel like the girl guides get overlooked, or seen as something old-fashioned or lame. I think that their story in the Second World War shows just how much heroism can come from young ladies, and I think we could stand to hear a few more stories like that. Hey folks, if this is your first time here, to be sure to subscribe down and click the bell notification to make sure you get the next video. I also want to let you guys know that in October, I'll be recording an interview with Dr. Christina Lee, a professor of Viking studies at the University of Nottingham, who found a potential antibiotic looking through ancient remedy books. I made a video about it that you can check out here. If you have anything you want us to talk about, leave a comment and send me a tweet or somehow get it in front of my face. Before I go, I'd like to thank my patrons here, as well as Don and Carrie Johnson for their generous support. And of course, a special thank you to Ines from Draw Curiosity and the legendary H-Bomber guy for helping class up the quotes. Thanks for watching and tune in next week for more Step Back. If you're wondering why I'm wearing a 1940s era home guard outfit, it's not because I'm historically inaccurate. It's because I found a box in the corner full of uniforms marked do not open until the Second World War. I do wonder what it meant by that. Oh dear.